welcome once again. This is Dr. Fred Smith at Houston Graduate School of Theology, Professor of Public Theology. And we have been having a discussion on violence and religion from a scriptural, Christian scriptural perspective. And, and we've talked about how the nature of both conflict and covenant are triangular in all centers around the notion of desire. Where we all left off last time in our discussion of conflict or acquisitive mimetic desire, remember acquisitive mimetic desire has to do with the desire, acquisitive means to have, okay? Mimetic means to imitate or to mimic desire to have. And it's not the desire for an object but it's, it's the copy and the desire of another for that object that brings upon the conflict in the memory. And we talked about extensively those dynamics in the Bible and also began to discuss those dynamics uh, in society today. But today we want to pick up on a notion that, that I have been working with. When I wrote uh, in my dissertation uh, many years ago, uh, a vision uh, without a vision, um, trying to understand black on black violence. And, and, and the reason why I took it up is I don't know if I ever told the story. My, uh, my uh, nephew, Hassan, uh, Hassan was the, well, he was my brother's son, my nephew. But my brother, for some reason, uh, was not able to care for him, and neither was his mother. So he, he came to live with my mother, his grandmother. And at the time, it was okay because I spent most of my time away at school. I, I'm from Oakland, California. I went to school in Boston at Harvard College. And Hyson was there, and I would visit him every time I came home for Christmas or during the summer. He slept in the same room a, as I did. And when I went away uh, to live in Texas and went to Perkins, he... He was still there, and, and he was growing older at this time, and I watched him grow up, find young man with these huge, huge brown eyes. I, I don't know if you, you've ever seen um, a child with these, these eyes that seem to be too big for their head, you know, and they look at you and they draw you in. That's how Hyson was, very intelligent, a, a very good athlete as well. Um, we were rivals in many, in many ways. Because I would have my, um, my rewards on the wall that I got from high school and junior high in our room. And every time I would come back, he would have been taking down another one and put up one of his own. And, and we, in the basketball court, we would, we would play basketball. I was an athlete back in the day. And uh, he was learned. And he would, he, would, he would, you know, basketball, he would shoot the three-point shot, you know, uh, anything to, 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 to win. He was, that's how he was. But um, when I entered into um, working on my Ph.D. at Emory, doing a, um, a research in Orlando, Florida, I got a call that Hassan had been killed. He'd been shot three times in the back of the head uh, by another young man. And, and I, I, I didn't understand why. Uh, and I, I won't go through the whole story because we don't have enough time, but I will tell you different parts of it at different times. But the bottom line was, High Sum grew like myself in the inner city with a lot of promise, but it was a lot he did not have or could not have as well. He desired what the world had. He became a, he became a crack dealer, I believe. I, the family believes it, to have the things of the world. And, and that, that brought envy, covetedness, or, or Hassan was a, well, he was not always doing the right things. But what, why, why, that was a question I had, and, and this notion of internalized oppression, to internalize the, 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 the uh, to, be, to, to, to un, be unable to conform in differentiation, to be able to 
conform a, a, a society that has a hegemonic relationship with you, where the culture defines for you who what good looking is, defines for you what success is, based upon its own premises that you could never achieve because of the boundaries, the differentiation, the separation, the Jim Crow, that, you know, and opportunities and living arrangements and health in every way that prevents you from achieving that which you desire, admire, that is external, that you can never achieve. At least it seems that way. And, and that, and, and, and what happens is that oppression, that double consciousness, takes place. So the rivalry becomes one of conflict seeking to destroy the other using the same tactics to win at all costs. It leads to social discrimination unless a, found, a foundation is soon. This, this is how it takes place on a, on a social level, but I'm talking about on an internal level as well. This intermediate desire, this conflict that comes together, you know, rages so you really the, you really the object disappears and you, you want to win and become at all costs, and you wind up destroying those that are closest to you. You can't destroy those who are far from you. That's external mediation. Internal mediation is your brother, is your same race, is those in your community, because of these unfulfilled desire and violence that pins up into you that becomes internal. So what do you need? You need a scapegoat. That is, when the mediation comes place and it's eternalized, the only way to stop it is to find something which both of you can unite against. That's called a scapegoat. A scapegoat is called a, a generative scapegoating mechanism, and, and we'll break down these terms as we go on, and hopefully you'll be able to understand them. It's really understood by Gerard is the source of, of uh, early religion. You see, the rivalries like this take place throughout nature and in the lower animals as well. Uh, you see dogs and you see, uh, you see monkeys and you see others. They fight, but they get to a certain point to where they don't destroy themselves, destroy the other community. One submits to the other. And then there's a, there's a stopping mechanism that takes place. Well, that's not the case in human beings. In human beings, this conflict, this, this mob mentality, this conflict can rage within the community, you, you know, call reciprocal violence. You know, uh, I kill your brother, you have to kill my brother. The Hatfields and the McCoys you know, that took place over a pig, <laughs> take place. But you, but you see it over and over again that, 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 that once you begin to take revenge and vengeance, and this is much of what happens in our communities, especially uh, in the communities uh, where high violent rates take place, a lot of it takes place as, as revenge killing, as reciprocal violence, and it's destroying the community unless you find a scapegoat. Well, I, <laughs> I don't want to go here, but something just occurred to me. Something just occurred to me. Um, I, I'm going to give you two examples. Um, during the Civil Rights Movement, and this is this early one, uh, when the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement came to a community and there was a march or there was some action, the statistics show that violence went down to zero. There was no black on black crime, there was no murder, there was no violence, there was no rape. It was the zero because the whole community was united, was united for a cause for their freedom. And we go back and you can study that. That, that. That's a fact. Almost everywhere throughout the South in these most violent communities, when, when the at direct action was taking place in those communities, it was totally focused and violence ceased in those communities. Now, I want to give you another example, something that, that I hadn't thought about it, and, and I can be challenged. I'm going to challenge myself on this. But in many, in many of our communities today, where murder, and I want, I want to do some science, some studying this, where, 
where, where murder is taking place and, and blacks are killing each other in droves and you see nothing, no, very little outcry. There's some outcry, you know, marches, but very little is done about it, you know, outcry for it. In, in the community itself, the violent rages on. But when a white officer shoots an innocent black or a black person, or especially a black young man, you know, the community coalesces, comes together, and scapegoats that incident. It brings a peace to that instrument. And so the third party, that both are warred against, the violent ends, and the scapegoat is expelled or murdered. Now, you can look at the criminal justice system. I mean, I can't make directions, but but I would really like to explore that phenomenon. But I want to turn away from the violence, because we see this every day, and I hope the framework that I'm beginning to discuss will help us to think about it and understand it in those kind of biblical and theological terms, to understand Adam, to understand um, uh, what happened, the original sin, what happened in the garden, and to understand Cain and Abel, and to understand Esau and Jacob, and to understand the disciples who were arguing among themselves, or who was going to be the greatest among us throughout the scriptures, and you see the underlying notion throughout the scripture of this kind of violence. What is the antidote to that? Well, Jesus asks, what is the greatest commandment? What is written in the laws and the prophets? When you sum up all the scriptures, what does it come down to? You shall, in, in Matthew, you can find this in Luke, you can find this you know, also in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy and other places, this description you shall love your Lord your God. You shall desire, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Your only model of desire, your true model of desire, your true object of desire, excuse me, your true object of desire is God. That's the greatest and first commandment. Don't desire what the world desire. Your model of desire you need to desire what God desires. And that's where the second commandment comes in. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two great commandments. And this is also a triangle desire, but it's a covenantal triangle where the self takes God as our model of desire. And God desires is to the love of the neighbor. And just so your desire, your covenant, this is more of an intimate, an intimate, cause the nerd, the love versus desire. So it's a model of love. So, <clears throat> this notion. So let's go on. So this is the same kind of intimate desire, both in covenant relationships, such as marriage. Now we know Marriage can also become rivalry <laughs> and can, can break down. But when love is there, and not just desire, but love is there, then you have a covenant relationship that takes you to a thick and thin. This is the relation, this is the covenant relationship between a parent and a child, where what the ch parent wants is the best for the child. And the child imitates the parent and what the parent desires. This is how a child is molded. This is how families are, des are created. This is the not desire to know, not the desire to have. Okay? So intimate mimetic desire is to imitate, instead of acquisitive, the acquisitive is desire to have. Remember? Intimate is the desire to know, to be intimate, to be in relationship. And so a covenant A covenant relationship is a relationship where the model, where the model is not a, a victim or a victimizer or, or an oppressor or an oppressed or victims or oppressors or, or black or, or white or, or any kind of uh, your sister or brother. 
you, though your intimate, your idolatry is taking something that is not God as your model of desire. So your model of desire, your, your mediator of your faith, the mediator of your desire for us is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ's ultimate desire is to love God with all his heart, mind, so they are one in love and in desire. And if we take Christ, he shows us how. What is to desire? It's desire God. And what does God desire? It is us. It's the neighbor and so forth. Ooh. <laughs> so so that, com that comes down, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the notion, to the understanding it is, is, is what is our transcendent source of desire. Ooh. What, what is it, who is it that we take as a model of desire that does not look like us, that is not finite, that that cannot cause us to, to, to seek to differentiate ourselves from it because there's so much like, could be so much like us or, or to make it to be like us, but something that is transcendent. To me, that is the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the nature of the good news. That, that instead of having a God that is, that is so distant, that, that is so far away that we can admire that God, we can worship and praise that God, but how do we know really what God desires? How, how, do, we, how do we model God? How do we worship God? How do we praise God the way Jesus Christ does as our model desire? And, 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 that, is, and that, is, that is what Paul spoke about, about imitating him as he imitates Christ. You get it? We can become, and we are, as we imitate Christ. Most often, by imitating one, our grandmother, our mother, our parents, our father, minister or the, the janitor, who is a wise, loving, and caring because he's a deacon in his church? How do we create a covenant community? And this is, this is what it comes down to when I speak about the beloved community. It is the beloved community that is founded on intimate, mimetic desire where everyone in that community models what it means to be Christ-like. And Christ-like to be like God, a God who is love. And so when I talk about it, I break down the, the principles of beloved community. It has to do with what you desire most what we love most. But how do we develop principles that we can live together in such a way that we can live Christ's life? And that is really the nature of the beloved community. We be in relationship. And how do we do this? First, it has to be a community where this intimate desire, this love, agape love, the, the desire to love one sacrificially, one more than you love yourself. This, this love is, is, is ruled and, and is, is rules and sets our laws and our policies in our society. One that's built on justice. That is justice to be in the right relationship with one another in doing those things that keeps us in the right relationship. What are, what are those things? Well, that's the second one. And that is 
to understand that like you, every one of us are created in the image of God. And therefore, there's no differentiation, there's no differentiation between us because we are both like God. And I don't have to make you, I can't make you like me because you are like God and you are like me in as much as you are like God. Intimate. So our principles have to be based upon the ultimate worth of every individual. Nothing less than that. That's the first principle, to love your neighbor as you love yourself in the polarity of their circumstances. That's the sex pr second principle. Second principle is that in order for us to know ourselves and to know God, we have to know all the different, or, or different faces of God, all the different configurations of God, all the different iterations of God, because all are, are created in the image of God. So black, white, Chicano, Hispanic, uh, African, Nigerian, Ghanaian, Chinese, Japanese, all of those are images of God. So diversity is necessary. And so all our policies and all that community is necessary, not to be tolerated, but it's important for us to be in covenant relationship with one another, with God taking Jesus Christ as our model. The next is important because as we went through the scripture, we can begin to see how we build a narrative that includes all of us. That, 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 that's why Christianity, one of the reasons why Christianity spread is because everyone can see themselves within the story that is unfolded in the Holy Bible. You can, you can see this as a place for you because we share a common story, a common narrative, and therefore a common future. And so whatever you bring to the story that you're a part of, you share in the ending, in the glory and eternal life of Jesus Christ. We, have, we can interpret you so well, you're a crack dealer, a dope dealer, prostitute, a rich man, poor man, whatever you bring when you enter into the beloved community and you put down your rivalry and seek to, to, to be like and to, to seek to be with and to be in relationship, that's nature of agape love. When you do that, you are born again. <laughs> that's what Nicodemus was asking. You are a new creature, Paul says. All things have passed away, and yea, Christ has made everything new. You are new, and we are ambassadors of Christ to the world, reconciling the world back to Christ, back to God, back into the image that God has placed us in. So your story is one of hope, of the new Jerusalem, of a of, of, of time where you can, you can eat and not buy. That's the vision. That's the spirituality, that's the religion, and that's the faith that we come with. But the final one is the one that is the most difficult for many of us. It's not difficult, it's not difficult for, for, uh, for God, but it's difficult for us. And that is that, that we are loved unconditionally and forever. Can, can you get that? that, that, that while, we were, while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us that we may participate in the reign of God the reign of love, the beloved community. We can do that because it is not a matter of, of what you've done. It's a matter of who you become in Christ Jesus. That, that's, that's the notion, that's the notion we talk about as is that we have favor. Not, not of our own but favor that comes through the blood, the death, 
that was shed on the cross by Jesus Christ. Not, not as a scapegoat. Not, as a, not, not just as a sacrificial lamb to appease the, the wrath of a, of, a, of a wrathful God. No, not, he died because he said we are to love one another as I have loved you, that I will give my life, not my life taken from me, that, I will, that you give your life for a friend. That is agape love. That is the nature of the covenant relationship that describes what it means to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Desire God as object and to love your neighbor as yourself and to understand that through what was demonstrated by Jesus Christ. He, he tells a story in, in that, in that, in that uh, scripture, Luke 10th chapter, 25th through 35th verse, 37th verse, that says, because we can ask the question, you know, what, who, is our, who is our neighbor? Who, who, who is it that we should love in this way? And he said, there was a man who was felled in Jericho Road by thieves and was left half naked and dead on the side of the road. And, and, and the good church goer, the priest, the, 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 Levi, the pre, Levites went by, the priest, the one who, who cared for the temple, walked by and crossed to the other side. The Jews went by, they, they, the priests went by, they, they went by to the other side, the good people who said they loved God. But the Samaritan, the, the Samaritan, the despised one, the least of these, stopped by the side of the road, bind the man, took him to the in took care of him while of his own resources and showed what it meant to love your neighbor. Because that's exactly what I would want to happen if I was on the side of the road. That's how I ought to treat my neighbor. That is the notion of love. Because he could have been killed by the same robbers. He expended his money. He went out of his way. But that is the nature of what a mother would do for a child. That's what a husband should do for a wife. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.